Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at an interesting data set of coffee. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different CSV files about coffee statistics through the years. Um, and so some of these are of different formats, but there's quite a few in here uh, that have the same 56 countries for each uh, of these CSV files. So what I'd like to do is try to predict the average production, average total production for a given country over the years. So this will involve combining together a whole lot of different data frames um, and it should be an interesting task. So let's hop into the notebook. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new one here. Uh, let me just get it set up real quick. All right, here we go. So I'm going to import NumPy and pandas for working with the data. And for pre-processing, we'll use the train test split function and standard scalar from sklearn. Uh, and our model today will be a random forest regressor. So let's go ahead and import all of that. Um, and so here, the first thing I'd like to do is gather up all of the um, file paths to the uh, CSV files that we would like. So I want to find all the ones that have the same 56 countries. The first one does not, uh, but this one does, this one does, this one does, this one does. And I believe the only one after that is total production. So I will get a list of all of these file paths. I'll just paste it in here. Um, there, so we have five uh, data frames in total that have these same 56 countries. And what I'd like to do is now um, put them all into a list. Uh, not, not the file paths, but the actual data frames themselves. So what we can say is create this empty, actually what we can do is use list comprehension to create a, a data frames list. Uh, that includes every data frame in uh, so what I want to do is use pandas.readcsv for a given data frame path sorry actually I'm doing this wrong let's put this here so we're going to load in um, a given data frame path get the data frame for every data frame path in data frame paths alright that'll do it so now uh, this will consist basically of all the data frames for each of the file paths. I'll have to run this. Okay. So DFs, for example, if we look at the first element, uh, DFs is the domestic consumption data frame, which is the first one here. If we look at the second element, it should be the exports calendar year. And there we go. Okay, and then I think, let me just... All right, so they all have different names. It looks like the name is contained in the in the country column. So we're gonna have to sort of consider that. All right, what I'll do is take, let's take a, a given one of these. What I wanna do is take the average statistic over all the years. So we can take the mean, this will be from 1990 until 2018. And we wanna take the mean over axis one, which means across the data frame. Now that'll take the mean, it already automatically does away with the categorical column. So these are the means we want. So I wanna create a function called get means uh, that will take in the data frame and sort of return this thing uh, with the countries sort of properly formatted. So we'll start off by creating a copy of whatever data frame we pass in. And then we'll get the countries uh, using, okay, so the column name's always different. For each of these, the country column name is different, but we can get the country column name uh, by using df.column sub zero. So it means uh, take the first column name and then take the column that's, that has that name, store that in countries, then get the means. And this will be just the mean across axis one. Then we will take both of these and concatenate them together. So we'll take countries uh, and means and put them next to each other. So axis one, store that back in df. And then we'll set the names of the columns now to be, um, we'll have country always for the country column. And then I want to get this name for the second column. So that's actually the name of countries of the countries series we have here. So we can actually type countries.name to get it. All right, let's show, show you what this does. Return data frame here. And then get means for df sub zero. So this does what we want. It takes, uh, it renames the country column to country. It puts the old country name over here. And then it, it uh, has the mean across all years in the given location. So now what I'd like to do is do this for all of our data frames and put them together into a single data frame. So I'm gonna create a function called makeDF 
takes in all of the data frames, in DFs, and we will process all data frames into one data frame. So we'll create, uh, I'll create a list called processed DFs, and that's an empty list. We'll populate it with the processed DFs. So for every data frame in DFs, let's append to our empty list the means for that data frame. All right, so now uh, process DFs contains this type of uh, data frame for each one of our data frames. And then what we'll do is merge them all together. So we can merge two data frames with the merge function. Let's say I merge the first one with the second one. Do it like this. This is uh, the first data frame, uh, the, the means of the first data frame merged with the second, with the means of the second data frame. Uh, but we didn't specify what column to merge on. I think it automatically chose country, but I do want to specify that explicitly on country. And you can see it found uh, examples between the data frames that had the same country and merged their values together. So we didn't lose any any uh, data here because uh, we know that both all these data frames have the same country values. Um, so I want to do this for all of them. So let's merge data frames. Um, so actually, I didn't do this yet. Process all data frames and then merge the data frames. So what I'll do is I'll initialize the first data frame. So we'll call it DF. And this will be the first data frame, which has already been processed. And then for all the rest of them, so for I in range, one to length of process DFs. So I'm doing one here to target, starting with the second element. We're gonna take the original data frame, that's the first one to start with, and merge it with the ith data frame. Like that, on country every time. So it starts off with the first one, merges on the second, uh, then this, like it accumulates. So then we have two data frames in one, we merge that with the third, uh, put three data frames in one, merge that with the fourth until we're done. And we will return this final uh, DF, which we have merged all together. All right, so let's, let's call that data, and that's make DF of our list of DFs. All right, one second. All right, and let's uh, test it out. Okay, yeah, sorry, so here it is. Um, we have our country, and then all of the stats for the given country. And these are average stats. So this is average domestic consumption, average exports, average exports crop year, average gross opening stocks, and then average total production, which is what we're trying to predict here. So now let's create a pre-process inputs function. And this is going to take in a data frame. We're going to pass data in. It's going to copy it over. Um, and so we want to process this into something that the model can see, it can use. So we don't need the country column because uh, it's unique for each, one, each example. We need all of these columns. And um, we're going to try to use the first four here to predict the total production. So in here, let me just delete this. Um, let us drop the country column. So df equals df dot drop, not copy, drop country from axis one. And then we will split the data frame into x and y. So y is what we're trying to predict. So that's the total production column. Uh, and x is all the rest of the data. So we'll drop it from axis one. Then we'll do our train test split. So this is gonna use the train test split function from sklearn. We pass in x and y. Let's give it a train size of 70% uh, and keep shuffle equals true on so that it'll shuffle the data frame before it makes the split. And we'll give it a random state so we can reproduce the shuffle. All right, then we'll that will return these four new sets of the data, x train, x test, y train, and y test. And let's return those down here. So we'll get them back over here using pre-process inputs and passing in data. So X train um, is 70% of the data. So actually you can't see how many that is, um, but it's not all the data. And then um, we don't have the total production that's being stored in Y train. 
Okay, so the, the uh, range of values that all these columns take on is different. So I want to standardize that for the model. Actually, we're using random forest today, so I don't think we actually have to do it. Yeah. Um, you know what, I'll do it anyway, just because if we wanted to switch out the model, um, we would be fine. Tree-based models, you don't have to scale. But I'm going to scale. Uh, it doesn't affect the performance. It's not like it's going to decrease it. Um, I'm going to scale in case we want to try different models. So we're going to fit the scalar to, it's a standard scalar, so it will give uh, each column a mean of zero and a variance of one. And we're going to fit it just to the train set, because we want to pretend we don't have access to the test set when we're doing the pre-processing. Then we'll transform the data using scalar.transform. Uh, however, the transform function returns a numpy array, so let's turn this back into a data frame afterwards, keeping the indices uh, the same as they were, and the column names the same as they were. And we'll do exactly the same thing for the test set. So we only fit to the train set, but we transform both the train and test set using that fit. All right, uh, so you can see they all take the same range of values now. Uh, most of the values will lie between negative one and one. All right, and we can start training and get the results. So uh, we're doing a random forest regressor. So let's just create that model equals random forest regressor from sklearn. Uh, let's fit the model on the train set, x train, y train, and then just print out a little message that says model trained. Okay. Now let's get the results. So what I want to do is make, create some predictions. I'll call the predicted values ypred, and that'll come from model.predict on x test. And so there's two uh, st metrics I want to get for the model to evaluate its performance on the test set. One will be the RMSE. So I'm not actually sure what unit this is in. Does it say here? Uh, total production. No, it doesn't say. Maybe it says on the site. Uh, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not sure the uh, actual unit that this is in, but we, but the RMSE, uh, which is the metric we're going to use, is the average error in the unit of the target variable. So, um, to calculate this, we take the uh, test set, uh, the, the actual answers, y test, and subtract the predicted values. This will be the error. Then we'll square all of these errors element wise, so that will be the squared errors. And we take the mean, so that will be the mean squared error. And then we take the square root, which is going to be the root mean squared error, or RMSE. And we'll print it out. Uh, RMSE displayed to two decimal places and format with RMSE. So the reason we square the error is so that we uh, we can we don't have to have positive and negatives canceling each other out. We want the errors to be on an absolute scale when we take the average. Um, and then we square root because once we square, we're in the squared unit of the target variable. So, so by square rooting, we, we bring it back to the original unit of the target variable. All right, so let's see. All right, so 7,454. This means on average, we're about, uh, well, yeah, we're about 7,454 uh, of of the original unit off. So here this goes up to 41,000. Um, yeah, some of these are in the tens of thousands. Others are quite small. Here's zero. Um, but on average, we're about 7,500 points off. So again, I don't know the unit, but this is in the unit that we are looking for. All right, the next, uh, the last metric we'll do is the R squared score. R squared score is saying how much better is your model than the null model. Uh, the null model being predicting the most frequent, uh, sorry, in, the, in a regression setting, null model is the, mo is the mean being predicted every time. So if we take Y test and take the mean, if we predict this value every single example, uh, that's null model because we don't have, we're not using any input data for that. So the R squared score is a measure of how much better your um, your predictions are than the mean prediction. So to calculate R squared, 
um, we are going to take uh, we're going to we're going to get our errors y test minus y pred sort of like we did up here and we're going to square it and these are the squared errors but instead of taking the mean I'm going to take the sum so this is the sum of squared errors quite big but we don't care about this value we care about the relationship between this value and the same value but calculated for the null model so if we take this one uh, and instead of pred uh, our predicted values we just guess the mean every time like that um, so if we look at just this part of it you'll see this is the mean that is the true values minus the mean every time we square that we take the sum we end up with something else so we want to compare this because uh, this is the sum of errors for each model this is our model uh, and this is the null model here so we can compare it in the following way we can just make a fa uh, fraction like this put one over the other um, and that has the effect of putting it on a scale of uh, positive inf uh, zero to positive infinity so when this is zero the whole thing goes to zero when this thing is uh, sorry, when this thing is much smaller than this, uh, the whole thing goes to zero. And when this thing is much larger than this, it goes to positive infinity. So that still does tell us um, about the comparison, but we'd like it to make a little more sense. So what we can do um, is actually take one minus this value. And what that has the effect of doing is that when this is much smaller than this, this whole thing goes to zero and one minus zero becomes one. So the best score we can have is one. On the other hand, if, if, our, if our errors are much bigger than the null model's errors, this whole thing goes to positive infinity, and one minus positive infinity is negative infinity. So in the worst case, we have uh, negative infinity. It, the, there's no lower bound on the R squared score. All right, so let's see what this is. Print out R squared and display this to five decimal places and format with R2 there. All right, and we got an R squared score of about 0.4. Now, just to verify that we got the calculation correct, we can also use the model.score function, just pass an X test, Y test to get the R squared score, and you'll see it's exactly the same. So this is saying we're about 40% better than the, the null model. Now, if the null model is really bad, this doesn't mean much, right? But uh, the, that's why we have the RMSE as well. So overall, it looks like the model is okay. Uh, we really didn't have much data here. Uh, we only had 56 examples in the whole data frame. Um, but that was some today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content. And leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.